Family values between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism. This is the first part of chapter five, which is called The Price of Promiscuity, The Chicago School Confronts AIDS. From society's point of view, an unattached person is an accident waiting to happen. The burdens of contingency are likely to fall immediately and sometimes crushingly on people, relatives, friends, neighbors, who have enough problems of their own, and then on charities and welfare agencies. All by itself, marriage is society's first and often second and third line of support for the troubled individual. A husband or wife is the social worker of first resort, the psychiatrist of first resort, the cop and counselor and insurer and nurse and 911 operate and 911 operate a first resort. Uh, that was a quote from Jonathan Rock from a book called Gay Marriage. What is the role of public intervention in the face of a health crisis caused in large part by private actions between consenting adults? This is the question posed by Richard Posner and Thomas Phillipson, two leading exponents of the Chicago Law and Economics School, in a work on the AIDS epidemic published in 1993. A prime example of the strategic economics imperialism of the Chicago School, Law and Economics is a methodology that sets out to apply the precepts of rational economic behavior to all areas of social life, including that of law. Its institutional success, first at Chicago, then at elite law schools across the United States, and subsequently within the entire Anglo-American legal curriculum, owes much to the background work of Aaron Director, a key figure in the early development of Chicago school economics. Its epistemic and judicial impact owes more to the academic contributions of Ronald Coase, whose classic 1960 text on the problem of, of social cost served to undermine the common sense acceptance of welfare state capitalism, and Richard Posner, a Reagan-era appointee to the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit and prolific writer whose numerous books have done much to popularize law and economics among the general public. The law and economics approach proceeds on the assumption that all areas of social life, including sexuality, can be analyzed as a market in which prices are not only economic indicators, but also measures of risk. Such work is premised on the view that people do not leave off acting rationally, do not suddenly cease responding to incentives when they leave the marketplace and go home, or for that matter, we would add to a singles bar, a homosexual bathhouse, or a shooting gallery where addicts, addicts inject themselves with needles shared among strangers. Even non-market markets can be analyzed according to this model if we consider that all transactions involve a calculation of the shadow price or risk associated with any given sexual act. We shall in short be proceeding on the assumption that the market for risky sexual trades or what is similar for the sharing of hypodermic needles that have not been decontaminated is in its relevant features much like other markets that economists study. The question is only to make clear that our analysis is not limited to prostitution. We refer to trade in the standard economic sense of an activity perceived as mutually beneficial to the persons involved in it. We must assume, for example, that individuals who engage in unprotected sex with full knowledge of the risks of HIV have done so after rationally calculating the costs and benefits involved. The shadow price of engaging in unsafe sex is the expected cost, both uh, pecuniary and non-pecuniary, with the latter dominant in this example, of becoming infected with the AIDS virus. It is another form of accident, or like a disease caused by smoking, another form of avoidable illness. Unsafe sex, in short, is a lifestyle choice, but one that responds perfectly to the mathematics of rational expectation. Posner and Philipson begin by asking whether the AIDS epidemic is really the monumental public health catastrophe it is made out to be. Most people who write about AIDS, they remark, believe that it is the public health crisis of the 20th century and requires massive public health intervention on both the regulatory and fiscal fronts. At the time Posner and Philipson were writing in the early 1990s, 
during the Republican administration of George H.W. Bush, many still believe that the United States had done far from enough to stem the spread of AIDS. The failure of the Reagan administration to respond to the epidemic with any kind of comprehensive prevention campaign was a scandal, not only to progressives, but also to more than a few conservatives within Reagan's inner circle. In October 1986, Surgeon General Everett Koop, an anti-choice Christian conservative who had been carefully selected for the task of the Reagan administra- by the Reagan administration, delivered an unexpectedly scathing report on Reagan's public health record. Koop concluded his report by urging the government to fund a sexually explicit AIDS prevention campaign and to abandon punitive interventions such as mandatory testing and the use of quarantine. In June 1988, a a presidential commission on AIDS headed by the social conservative Admiral James D. Watkins released a further report calling on the government to dramatically increase the public resources it devoted to AIDS and blaming underfunding of the healthcare system as a whole for the current state of the crisis. Both reports were promptly buried at the instigation of Christian conservatives and supply-siders within the Reagan administration. As neoliberals Posner and Philipson stood in a complex relationship to Reagan's political circles, unlike several of Reagan's social conservative conservative advisors, Posner and Philipson were vehemently opposed to any revival of the old public health tradition and its paternalist measures. In their view, normative judgments about sexual deviance or perversion were counterproductive to the smooth functioning of markets, as a quasi-market replete with shadow prices. The arena of sexual trades functioned most efficiently when it was free from the state regulations of quarantine or mandatory testing. Michel Foucault was one of the first to point to the radical anti-normativity of the Chicago School neoliberals, just as they rejected the disciplinary and regulatory institutions of the 20th century welfare state as so many barriers to the efficient functioning of market logics. Neoliberal theorists such as Friedman, Becker, and Posner were methodologically indifferent to the normative categories of the 20th century social sciences and their allied disciplines. They thus found themselves somewhat unexpectedly aligned with the new left, yet Posner and Philipson were in complete agreement with Regan that the social costs and therefore the urgency of a concerted federal-level public health response to the AIDS epidemic had been greatly exaggerated, taking into account the limited life expectancy of AIDS patients in the early 1990s and the correspondingly foreshortened burden on public welfare programs such as Medicaid, they calculated that the AIDS crisis might in fact have saved the state money in terms of long-term social security payments. Those who were dying of AIDS in the greatest numbers tended on average to be young but poor and relatively unproductive. Aside from being ill, many of them were drug users. The state, therefore, would have lost relatively little in terms of productive working years from their premature deaths. According to Posner and Philipson, the costs of the disease were likely to be self-limiting. Despite the great suffering that AIDS has engendered, the net external costs of the disease, the focus of the economic case for public intervention, might be relatively modest were the disease left to run its course without public intervention. More important for Posner and Philipson was the fact that the peculiar mode of transmission of the HIV virus tended to limit, by its very nature, the kinds of external social costs commonly associated with communicable disease in the public health tradition. Unlike most communicable diseases, AIDS is spread primarily by by voluntary intimate contact between human beings. Apart from the limit cases of rape and contaminated blood transfusion, The HIV virus is the result of voluntary sexual contact between consenting adults and thus represents the very prototype of the rational transaction and the freely assumed risk. Public health economists Posner and Philipson observed have tended to regard communicable disease as a textbook case of negative externality, that is, an exchange of pathogens that generates social costs beyond the strict bounds of the consensual transaction and have therefore tended to advocate state intervention as a necessary response. The social costs of tuberculosis, for example, cannot be internalized by the use of private contracts that would limit the effects of sneezing in public to freely consenting parties.
nor can waterborne disease that flows through public waterways and pipes be confined within the limits of the contract. Even by the admission of Posner and Philipson, the classical public health externalities of involuntary infection necessitate some kind of collective response, however limited. Yet HIV is different, they argue, in the sense that it is most often transmitted through voluntary acts of unprotected sex or needle exchange. At least since 1984, when the virus and its mode of transmission was first ascertained, we can assume that most of those who have contracted AIDS have done so as the result of a freely assumed cost-benefit calculus. The HIV-infected have no doubt calculated that the cost of reducing the risk of the disease to zero through a change in behavior is greater than the expected cost in disease, disability, and death of the risk itself. We may marvel at the fact that some place so low a price on the risk of infection that African-American women and drug users, for example, seem to have above average discount rates or derive little utility from living, but in no way should we be so paternalistic as to limit their freedom to assume risks. Clearly, such risk takers have reasoned that the immediate rewards of pleasure maximization are greater than the long-term costs of infection and have acted accordingly. Why then should the state be expected to ensure their choices? Why should the intimate and personal costs of private transactions between freely consenting adults be redistributed among the public? For Posner and Philipson, the risks of HIV transmission are fully internal to the markets in unsafe sex or intravenous drug use and should therefore be privately assumed by those who participate in them. As long as it poses no substantial social costs, the freedom to take sexual risks should never be limited or regulated by state paternalism, but nor should it be reinsured by the state in the form of subsidized health care, public education programs, or federally funded research. We are all of us free to assume or shun the risks of sexual pleasure, and each of us is individually responsible for the risks we have chosen to bear. But having rejected the paternalism of the old public health model, Posner and Philipson somewhat surprisingly go on to outline a specifically utilitarian argument against promiscuity and in favor of monogamy. The public health response to the AIDS epidemic is not only unwarranted, they argue, it is also likely to generate perverse incentives of its own. While individual preferences are always rational and never perverse within a law and economic perspective, incentives themselves can sometimes be considered perverse particularly when they approximate those of the welfare state. The problem is posed as one of moral hazard when the state subsidizes health care for those who have voluntarily assumed the risks of infection. It ends up lowering the price of high-risk behavior and endorsing irresponsible lifestyle, lifestyle choices such as promiscuity or addiction. The law of large numbers dictates that any public health intervention that fails to condemn promiscuity will increase the, prof the probability of unsafe sex acts or accidents, broken condoms, for example, and hence lead to an increase in HIV infection. Anything that lowers the costs of sex will increase the amount of it, and, in and an increase in the amount of sexual activity will increase the incidence of AIDS, provided that at least some of the activity is unsafe. This is where Posner and Philipson identify a problem with publicly funded safe sex campaigns. Since the promotion of safe sex implicitly condones promiscuity, this in turn will tend to generate higher rates of seroprevalence through the sheer statistical likelihood of accidental contamination. At least on this issue, Posner and Philipson concede the moral conservatives have a point, although they insist that their own aversion to promiscuity derives entirely from a utilitarian concern with minimizing state health care expenditures. The regulatory response to public health externalities is ultimately counterproductive. In its efforts to ensure social risks, whether through direct social insurance or the state funding of prevention programs,
the state creates more social costs than would otherwise exist under competitive free market conditions. Ensuring irresponsible lifestyle choices begets more of the same. How then should the state intervene, if at all, to counter such perverse incentives? What should the government do to counter the undesirable effects of its own interventions? Here, Posner and Philipson come up with a regulatory response to externalities that is axiomatic within the neoliberal literature, but rarely acknowledged or analyzed as part of its economic discourse on market failure. To counteract the social costs of unsafe sex, they argue the state would do well to limit its interventions to promoting marriage. While skeptical about the utility of using tax money to subsidize safe sex and prevention campaigns then, Posner and Philipson are enthusiastic about the prospects of marriage as a way of limiting the health and economic costs of HIV. And they are some of the earliest to advocate the legalization of same-sex marriage as a way of reducing the exorbitant costs of promiscuity and the gay male community. While at present the social costs of AIDS are borne by the public in the form of Medicaid and other health services, they note the recognition of same-sex marriage would return at least some of these externalities to the private household, forcing individual risk-takers to internalize the costs of their own actions and transforming public risks into private responsibilities. Posner and Philipson anticipate that the legal recognition of same-sex marriage would help to internalize the costs of AIDS on two fronts, biomedical and economic. First, by placing a premium on monogamy, marriage would increase the psychological costs of, prom of promiscuous sex and thus decrease the average rate of infection. But it would also internalize economic costs by transferring at least some of the burdens of care onto a spouse. In an earlier text, Posner refers to the insurance function of marriage, pointing the, to the fact that marriage is expected to serve as a form of risk, risk protection in those social contexts where kinship has receded, but market and social insurance is not yet common, or we might add, has significantly diminished. This insurance function of marriage, he writes, arises from the fact that the correlation of spouses' health and other welfare factors is less than one. So given a mutual obligation of support and assistance, marriage serves as a form of health, hunger, and life insurance. Ultimately, then, Posner and Philipson identify the legal institution of marriage as a substitute for social insurance and the most efficient means of minimizing the social costs of health care. In this way, the neoliberal critique of normativity ends up endorsing an alternative form of moral philosophy, one that restores the private family and its legal obligations of care to a foundational role in the free market order. Here we encounter an aspect of neoliberalism that eludes the terms of Foucault's now classic analysis. Neoliberals may well be in favor of the decriminalization of drugs, sodomy, bathhouses, and prostitution, and are adamantly opposed to the kind of normative police powers that regulated or outlawed such practices under the mid-20th century welfare state. Yet their apparent moral indifference comes with the provis proviso that the costs of such behavior must be full fully born in private. Posner himself is at pains to make clear that libertarian is not the same thing as libertine or free love. Interestingly enough, referring to Foucault's late work on the use of pleasure as the perfect example of such a non-normative yet non-libertarian ethics. The anti-normativity of Chicago school neoliberalism is contingent upon a moral philosophy of prudential risk management that leaves no excess costs to the state. This double allegiance finds expression in the idea that non-normative sexual relationships must ultimately be channeled into a legal form of marriage. Neoliberalism against social insurance. Idiosyncratic as the views of Posner and Philipson might at first appear, they are strictly consonant with the wider critique of social insurance that has been developed and refined by Chicago school neoliberals since the late, since the late 1960s. <clears throat> in a public conversation now dominated by the assumptions of neoliberal reason, it is disconcerting to recall the very different forms of common sense shared by orthodox economists of a previous generation. For many of the leading economists of the mid-20th century, however, the idea that social insurance represented the most efficient means of addressing social risks was a given. 
Together, neoclassical welfare economists such as A.C. Pijou and neo-Keynesians such as Kenneth Arrow and Paul Samuelson helped to popularize the idea that certain kinds of externalities, whether positive or negative, were best managed by the state via regulation, state licensing laws, or taxation. These representatives of pre- and post-war economic orthodoxy articulated their defense of the welfare state in the neoclassical language of social utility and efficiency, a compromise that allowed them to formally justify the economic legitimacy of government intervention while still pledging allegiance to the iconic neoclassical model of free markets. In the face of market failure, they argued, public goods such as airwaves, transport infrastructure, or healthcare were best distributed by the state, while social harms such as pollution, car accidents, or illness were most efficiently dealt with by state regulation or taxation. The simplest solution to the unavoidable accidents of industrial life was the collectivization and redistribution of these risks via social insurance. Neoclassical welfare economists were slow to address the specific question of health insurance, but when they did so, provided crucial arguments for the expansion of collective health care in the form of Medicaid and Medicare in the post-war era. In 1963, Kenneth Arrow was commissioned by the Ford Foundation to provide an economist's perspective on the problem of uncertainty in medical markets. After reviewing the peculiar characteristics of healthcare risks and noting the persistent failure of commercial markets to insure them, Errol concluded that the welfare case for insurance policies of all kinds was overwhelming. The American government should therefore assume a much greater role in underwriting the healthcare risks of its citizens by redistributing the costs of unpredictable illness events. Among a broad group of people, he argued, the law of large numbers tended to diminish the average individual burden of health care, allowing even the poorest and sickest of citizens to access care they might otherwise have foregone. In so doing, social insurance resulted in a net social gain which might be of considerable magnitude. Neoclassical theories of market failure were well established, even hegemonic, by the 1960s. The dominant paradigm in post-war American economics, the so-called neoclassical synthesis combining neoclassical microeconomics with Keynesian macroeconomic theory, articulated a powerful defense of government intervention in the face of market failure. But it is also during this decade that a concerted offensive against neoclassical welfare economics began to take shape. What we now refer to as American neoliberalism emerged out of the Chicago School of Law and Economics, the Virginia School of Public Choice Theory, their various satellite schools throughout the United States, and the more institutionally marginal American Hayekians, all of whom, despite their differences, evinced a common aversion to the expanding reach of New Deal social insurance. Much like their neo-Keynesian counterparts, neoliberal economists and legal theorists spoke the idiom of neoclassical economics. But they combined this with a return to classical liberal principles of competitive markets, freedom of contract, and private tort law, which they sought to mobilize against the growing influence of welfare economics and public interest law in American political life. Even as they adopted the same formal language as post-war neo-Keynesians then, Neoliberals sought to reinsert the analytics of risk within the punitive and contractual framework that characterized 19th century tort law. With its related notions of strict personal responsibility, retribution, and fault. In 1968, the public choice economist Mark Pauly published a brief response to Kenneth Arrow that would redefine the the conversation around health insurance over the following decades. Written in a deceptively unassuming style, Polly's article simply and bluntly reversed Arrow's conclusions by invoking the now ubiquitous concept of moral hazard. Much like other consumer products, Polly insisted, demand for health care is not a constant that can be calculated with reference to social justice or public health principles, but a variable that responds haphazardly to the fluctuations of supply. Public health insurance distorts the true, that is, equilibrium or competitive market price of healthcare by shifting the costs from the risk prone to the risk averse. In 
when the costs of healthcare are redistributed across a large risk pool, it is in the interest of each individual to consume as much medical care as possible, with the paradoxical result that healthcare premiums are raised for all subscribers. Public, public health insurance, Polly concluded, generates a problem of moral hazard that fatally compromises its aims, resulting in a net welfare loss rather than a gain. The problem of moral hazard, moreover, extends also to the psychological effects of social insurance, as Posner pointed out in an influential review of the work of legal theorist Guido Calabresi on the social costs of accidents. Here, Posner argued that social insurance shields the individual from the true costs of his or her behavior, and thus distorts the otherwise bracing psychological effects of risk in a competitive free market environment. The classical liberal solution for managing the costs of accidents, private tort law, and common law litigation may well appear inefficient by the technocratic standards of the modern welfare state, but it at least has the virtue of inspiring personal responsibility. Social insurance, on the other hand, actively discourages the classical liberal virtues of prudence and self-care by subsidizing the costs of high-risk behavior. Given what he saw as the overwhelming problem of moral hazard, Pauli concluded that the government should play a limited role in underwriting risk and instead delegate this role to private insurers, who in turn should be allowed to price each customer individually on the basis of his or her risk profile. Far from suffering from an underdeveloped welfare state, Americans were overinsured. Taking this argument to its logical conclusion, Polly suggested that commercial failure to insure certain risks must be accepted as the final and irrevocable judgment of the market. Some risks are simply uninsurable and should be left in the residual actuarial category of the act of God. In the medium term, however, he recommended a number of practical reforms to the insurance market. Insurers, for instance, should be allowed to transfer the true costs of risk-taking back to the consumer. Subscribers with pre-existing conditions should be asked to pay higher premiums. <clears throat> User fees, such as deductibles and co-payments, should be implemented to give consumers an incentive to modify their behavior and consumers considered to be high risk, as gay men would later be, should be priced accordingly or excluded as uninsurable. To do otherwise would be to unfairly burden the risk averse with the costs of others' irresponsible behavior. If public welfare and insurance schemes such as Medicaid and Medicare were to be maintained at all, they should be designed to act only as insurers of last resort for emergency health care and catastrophic risk, that is, risk deemed unprofitable and thus uninsurable by private interests. The economic problem of moral hazard, Polly insisted, has little to do with morality, as it is conventionally understood. It simply represents the logical expression of rational economic behavior in the face of perverse incentives. When the consequences of risk-taking are insured by the state, it is in the rational interest of the consumer to engage in irresponsible behavior. Yet the neoliberal argument against social insurance does not so easily escape the charge of moralism, since it returns us inescapably to the logic of 19th century tort law with its attendant moral categories of personal responsibility, fault, and desert. desert. Indeed, neoliberal legal theorists explicitly revive the notion foundational to classical tort law, that freedom of contract implies the voluntary assumption of risk. Valenti non fi fit injuria? To he who has consented no wrong can be done, is the legal translation of the idea that risk, once consented to, must be borne entirely by the individual, unless one can prove fraud or duress in the performance of a contract. Crucially, this object is this object interprets self-inflicted harm as equivalent to consensual harm, and thus without hope of redress. One must assume the price of one's own choices, unless one can prove explicit fault or negligence by a contractual counterparty. The fault of irresponsible behavior is all one's own and thus deserved. It is in defense, or it is in deference to this principle, that Posner and Philipson formulate their policy response to the AIDS epidemic – 
a response that draws a sharp distinction between those who were unknowingly exposed to the risks of HIV infection prior to the discovery of the virus and those who assume the risks with full knowledge of its mode of transmission. If Posner and Philipson are willing to allow a case for state intervention on behalf of the unwitting victims of AIDS infection, they are adamant that most AIDS patients must assume full responsibility for their own choices. In any case, they muse, with each passing year, the fraction of AIDS victims who became infected before enough was known about the disease to enable avoidance by behavioral changes. The victims whose plight makes the strongest case for publicly financed AIDS research as a form of social insurance declines. Involuntary exposure may well justify government intervention against the market failures of private healthcare markets. But when risk is content, consented to, the costs are all one's own. Private insurers are well within their rights to exclude the HIV infected from their health care policies, since exposure to HIV through consensual sex or drug use is a voluntary risk, whose costs must be assumed by the individual. From the point of view of competitive health care markets, those who have willingly submitted to the risks of HIV infection lie outside the bounds of the insurable. Deinstitutionalization, how neoliberalism uh, um, as assimilated or assimilated the left, the new left. AIDS was first observed, although not officially named or identified as stemming from a virus in 1981, a time of profound upheaval in the American healthcare system. President Reagan was elected in 1980, vowing to control rapidly inflating healthcare costs, rationalize healthcare delivery, and drastically cut federal budgets to welfare and social insurance programs such as Medicare and Medicaid. From the vantage point of the early 1980s, it must have been difficult to recall that barely a decade previously, President Nixon had been on the verge of implementing a national health insurance program. The political force of the labor movement was so strong at this point that Nixon was perpetually waging a rear guard action to assimilate and moderate the more radical plans of his opponents to the left while even traditional opponents of social insurance such as the American Medical Association, AMA, and private insurers were so resigned to the idea that they sponsored proposals of their own. The 1970s witnessed a profusion of Paris state healthcare experiments, ranging from the women's healthcare movement to the Black Panther Free Healthcare Clinics, and various countercultural initiatives providing everything from sexual health services to recreational drug care. These experiments were contiguous to and in some cases directly enabled by Johnson's Great Society agenda, itself an exercise in federal deinstitutionalization that sought to undercut the entrenched power structures of, munis of municipal and state government by delegating power to local communities. In 1965, the United States Office of Economic Opportunity, or OEO, the body responsible for administering Great Society poverty programs, began distributing grants to hospitals, health departments, and nonprofits to create neighborhood health centers in low income areas throughout the country. Inspired by the most progressive currents in the American public health tradition, these health centers embodied ideas that had been espoused by healthcare reformers since the early 20th century including concepts of comprehensive health care, social medicine, and community participation, and sought to deliver high-quality health care to the most impoverished sections of the population. The federal government had never been invested so much had never before invested so much money in the progressive tradition of American social medicine. Yet, as valuable and enabling as these federal programs were, the New Left's healthcare improve or healthcare movement very quickly outran the strictures of Great Society liberalism, generating a plethora of initiatives that had a much more antagonistic relationship to the state. The Black Panther healthcare movement, for instance, evolved out of a critique of the war on poverty and its failure to deliver anything other than token reform even though many of those who helped set up the Black Panther clinics had been and indeed remained actively involved in the Great Society's neighborhood health centers. Drawing on the professional and sometimes material resources provided by the institutional healthcare sector, the Black Panthers sought to distinguish their efforts from Johnson's neighborhood health centers, 
by locating their clinics outside the walls of the public teaching hospital, a space associated with endemic racism and combining political mobilization with the provision of health care. The relationship between these clinics and the state was a subject of intense debate within and outside the movement. Most Black Panther clinics refused to apply for federal or state funding and instead relied on skill sharing by medical professionals and regular donations of discarded medical supplies. But this also limited the scope of their services to primary and preventative care and obliged them to refer more difficult cases back to the institutional health care sector, a fate avoided by at least one Black Panther clinic based in Portland, which broke ranks by successfully applying for a mix of state, federal, and private funding. At the same time, federal administrators were variously alarmed by a movement that seemed to be siphoning government resources toward overtly militant initiatives, and impressed by the ability of the Black Panthers to actually deliver the kind of self-managed services envisaged by the War on Poverty. The Black Panthers were kept under intense surveillance by the FBI, even while federal administrators sometimes tried to persuade them to contract their health care services to the state. <clears throat> Although its politics were at times diametrically opposed to those of the Black Panthers, notably on the issue of abortion, the women's health movement practiced a similar ethic of political disobedience vis-a-vis -vis the state. Feminist health care activists challenged the paternalism, challenged the paternalism of a medical profession dominated by men and the inordinate power of the medical sector to define the limit women's define and limit women's sexual and reproductive experiences these activists came into open conflict with the authority of the AMA when they advocated home birth and lead midwifery as alternatives to the medicalized experience of childbirth they were forced to work beyond the limits of the law when they challenged the power of the state to regulate women's sexuality though anti, or through anti-abortion laws. In the late 1960s, activists involved in the Chicago Women's Liberation Union learned how to perform abortions and were reportedly carrying out up to 50 procedures a week by the time of the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973. Less well-known, but no less consequential in light of the subsequent history of AIDS service activism, was the network of gay health care clinics set up in major cities throughout the 1970s. In Chicago, gay medical students opened up the Howard Brown Health Care Center in 1974 and used it as a base from which to send a mobile STD testing van around to bars and bathhouses. And in Boston, with its well-established feminist health movement, gay and lesbian health activists took over the Fenway Community Health Care Center in 1975, where they provided various classes and services, including a free once-a-week VD clinic. Such initiatives were notable not only for their commitment to self-care outside the boundaries of the medical institution, but also because they refused to valorize sexual health over sexual desire. The publications produced by these early gay health initiatives offer some of the earliest articulations of safe, safe sex education, where the goal is to minimize harm without sacrificing pleasure. Together, these heterogeneous liberation fronts spearheaded a general movement of insurrection against the total institution, Goffman, and disciplinary powers, Foucault of the 20th century social sciences. The mental hospitals, prisons, homes for the disabled, the delinquent and deviant that were responsible for defining and policing notions of sexual and racial variance. With gathering momentum, these movements challenged the epistemic power of professional elites to pathologize non-normative experience and called for the radical, re radical deinstitutionalization of care. Their critique had a lasting impact on the landscape of social welfare, forcing professional monopolies to retreat, regroup, and in the last instance, reinvent themselves. Where Cold War interest groups such as the homophile movement merely sought to neutralize the stigma of, de of devi deviance, the new liberation movements challenged the very legitimating function of the norm and its status within the social and clinical sciences. It was in the spirit of radical critique that the gay liberation movement launched a successful campaign to remove homosexuality from the American psyche. 
Psychiatric Association's list of mental illnesses in the early 1970s. For these activists, homosexuality was no longer a psychopathology or deviation from the medical norm, but simply a different practice of sexuality, a style of life among others. It is important to stress, however, that the anti-normativity of these movements never implied a rejection of social insurance as such. Indeed, the new liberation movements were in a very direct sense enabled and invigorated by the democratization of so social insurance that had occurred in the mid-1960s, when social security was extended to Fordism's non-standard workers and public health care reached the in indigent, the disabled, and the aged. The health activists of the new left remained committed to the expansion of government-funded care and universal health insurance, even while they fought to dismantle the disciplinary forms in which these services were delivered. If they were intent on banishing the taxonomic function of the norm, the norm as a statistical means of cataloging the standard human subject, and his deviations in morphological and psychopathological terms, they simultaneously sought to extend social insurance beyond the limits of the family wage, that is, to incorporate the non-normal risk within the calculative logic of social protections. Ultimately, perhaps such a project was not possible or practicable within the limits of the Keynesian administrative state, and in the long run would have required a complete rethinking of the forms and practices of social risk protection. Yet we misrepresent the historical specificity of these movements if we focus exclusively on their anti-institutional critique and fail to recognize their efforts to radicalize the imaginary of social redistribution. It was this combination of redistributive and anti-normative objectives, after all, that made these movements so threatening to the New Deal consensus, ultimately catalyzing the formation of the neoliberal social conservative alliance. In 1970, the combined political force of trade union and new left advocates of universal health insurance held Nixon in its grip, forcing him to the left on almost all social welfare issues. Nixon looked poised to usher in a long-awaited and much-needed program of universal health insurance, yet only a few years into his tenure, these reforms were looking decidedly less certain as the prospect of spiraling inflation brought Nixon's conservative advisors to the fore and the Nixon presidency itself descended into scandal. President Ford, who had entered office proclaiming his intention to push forward with universal health insurance, ended up shelving the project indefinitely as employers complained of impossible health care costs. Ford's abdication proved to be the final blow, definitively banishing universal health insurance from the political agenda for many years to come. In this newly austere context, the neoliberal critique of social insurance moved beyond the walls of academia to find a receptive audience among policymakers and public health specialists. And over the next few years, the muted ethic of moral hazard, fault, and responsibility that informed neoliberalism's, neoliberalism's academic critiques of the welfare state found more fulsome expression and a new public health rhetoric focused on irresponsible lifestyle choices and rising health care costs. In 1976, the Task Force on Health Promotion and Consumer Health Education, sponsored by the very respectable National Institutes of Health and American College of Preventative Medicine, stressed the overriding importance of individual behavior and lifestyle as major factors in the nation's unsatisfactory health status and ever-rising health care bill. Writing in the neoconservative public interest, the bioethicist Leon Cass went so far as to blame the inflation of health care costs on the unintended consequences of no-fault insurance. All the proposals for national health insurance, he remarked, embraced or embrace without qualification the no-fault principle. They therefore choose to ignore or to treat as irrelevant the importance of personal responsibility for the state of one's health. As a result, they pass up an opportunity to build both positive and negative inducements into the insurance payment plan by measures such as refusing or reducing benefits for chronic respiratory disease care to persons who continue to smoke. 
by blaming irresponsible lifestyle choices on the existence of social insurance, Cass, like other neoconservatives, implied that healthcare inflation was foremost a moral affliction that would be that would be best overcome by reintroducing notions of fault into the everyday practice of risk management. Having emerged from the margins of economic and public health orth orthodoxy at the beginning of the 1970s, the neoliberal critique of social insurance had acquired something akin to common sense status by the end of the decade. The plausibility of the neoliberal healthcare reform agenda can be credited, at least in part, to its willingness to accommodate the leftist critique of institutional healthcare while simultaneously neutralizing leftist arguments in favor of social redistribution. Thus, the new left challenge to the authority of the medical profession was translated by neoliberal reformers into an unrelenting attack on the monopoly powers of the AMA and private practice physicians. Deinstitutionalization now appeared as an excellent method for outsourcing care to the home and a perfect rationale for substituting the unpaid labor of the private carer for the wage labor of the medical professional. Even prepaid group practice, once considered a slightly subversive experiment in cooperative health care and bitterly challenged by the AMA, was now embraced as an organizational model capable of rationalizing health care costs. In the guise of the HMO, or Health Maintenance Organization, and touted as the most efficient means of introducing competitive forces into the health care market. The cooperative, anti-hierarchical healthcare practices once envisaged by the left were now to be managed by for-profit companies that saw them as an ideal method for reducing expenditures. The field of public health, once inseparable from the theory of social medicine, was not immune to the influence of neoliberal health economics, and in the 1970s it began to revise many of its founding assumptions. By this time, it was becoming clear to epi epidemiologists that in wealthier societies, infectious diseases were giving way to non-communicable diseases as the leading cause of illness, and that many of these could be linked to avoidable behaviors such as overeating, smoking, or lack of exercise. Moreover, it seemed that many of the residual infectious diseases that continued to affect wealthier populations, in particular asymptomatic and undetected STDs, were linked to unprotected sex. In much the same way that neoliberal critiques of public health focused on the limit case of the self-induced harm, public health policies began to orient themselves around the problem of lifestyle choice and its presumed social costs. The president of the Rockefeller Foundation, once the leading philanthropic player in international public health, complained that the cost of sloth, gluttony, alcoholic intemperance, reckless driving, sexual frenzy, and smoking is now a national and not an individual responsibility. This is justified as individual freedom, but one man's freedom and health is another man's shackle in taxes and insurance premiums. Even longtime advocates of universal health insurance began to wonder out loud if inflating health care costs could be attributed to the prevailing hedonistic lifestyle of affluent Americans, and if responsible taxpayers should be expected to bear the cost of such lifestyle choices. In Canada in 1974, the United Kingdom in 1976, and the United States in 1979, health authorities called for the expansion of public health interventions beyond traditional medical and surgical care to encompass preventative measures targeting personal behavior and unhealthy lifestyles. No longer should these interventions focus on the statistical risk, the risk that could be abstracted from will or fault, or negligence, but on self-inflicted harms that could be attributed entirely to the volition of the individual. Daniel, Daniel Wickler, a critic of this shift in public health priorities, summarizes the consequences of this new ethic. If we become sick or disabled as a result of neglecting to take, to take care of ourselves, or by having taken undue risks, then dealing with these health needs should be seen as personal rather than social responsibilities, and as such should not be considered on a par with other unavoidable health needs. The question of whether or not one has voluntarily assumed and thus consented to risk becomes decisive within this, top, this optic. <laughs>
Social insurance, if it is to become economically sustainable, should be limited to covering illness events that occur independently of the will of the insured. One should not expect the public health system to redistribute the costs of voluntary risks. Without abolishing social insurance altogether, then, the neoliberal critique of public health eats away at the edges of redistributive health care by introducing the distinction between the deserving and the undeserving ill, the faultless victim and the self-harming risk-taker, into the calculus of social harms. The person who has inflicted harm on himself by engaging in an imprudent lifestyle must be assumed to have taken this risk knowingly and is by definition unworthy of compensation. The politics of self-care aids in the Regan era. The AIDS epidemic could hardly have emerged at a less propitious time in the recent history of public health. In the early 1980s, municipal governments had endured more than a decade of inflating social service costs and were in the full throes of a fiscal crisis induced by the Volcker shock. The mass redundancies brought about by recession meant that the number of people without private insurance was growing at a vertiginous rate. The Reagan administration's first major budgetary intervention, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, or OBRA, passed in 1981, exacerbated the already growing pressure on the public health care system by slashing the federal contribution to Medicaid and allowing states to implement further restrictions of their own. Regan's new federalism called on the federal government to decrease its role in social service funding. In practice, it delegated the responsibility for implementing budget cutbacks onto state and local levels of government, leaving them with the freedom to decide where the acts should fall. Following OBRA, the states in cities that had been hardest hit by budget crisis, such as the recently bankrupt New York, took the opportunity to drastically reduce the Medicaid reimbursements they paid to hospitals. This had an immediate effect on the hospital emergency room that the hospital emergency rooms that were often the first port of call for impoverished patients. Private hospitals had long been reluctant to accept the indig- the indigent but now saw Medicaid patients as an outright threat to their profits and responded by transferring them en masse to the overcrowded emergency rooms of public hospitals. At a time when freely accessible health care was more urgently needed than ever, the so-called emergency room dumping crisis was the most visible symptom of a public health sector under severe budgetary strain. The neoliberal project to reform social services involved several mutually reinforcing processes of political and institutional devolution. While Regan's new federalism transferred authority to enact budget restrictions from federal to state and municipal levels of government, the transfer of social service costs also occurred at the level of the healthcare institution itself. As the managed care movement sought to outsource the labor of care from the hospital to the nonprofit sector to the home. In 1983, the Regan administration introduced a new system for reimbursing costs under Medicare and Medicaid that set limits on the length of time a patient could be hospitalized. In the past, a fee for service system had allowed medical practitioners to charge as many services as they liked to public insurance. The new system attached spending decisions to diagnosis and placed an absolute limit on the recoverable costs for each diagnosed condition. Hospitals would lose money if they let patients overstay this limit, but make a profit if they managed to discharge patients earlier. In an environment where healthcare budgets were already strained, this decision had the effect of encouraging hospitals to discharge patients as early as possible even when they still required highly skilled forms of care. Hospital-based care was replaced, if at all, with intermittent health care visits at home. As the burden of care shifted from the expensive labor of securely employed professionals to a feminized workforce of home health care workers, often employed as independent contractors. But for the most part, health care simply shifted from the institution to the home and from the healthcare professional to the unpaid labor of family members, overwhelmingly sisters, mothers, and daughters. Reports of the death of the family have been greatly exaggerated, 
Regan proclaimed as he announced the creation of an official home care week. <clears throat> the home should be the setting of first choice for care and treatment because it is conducive to healing. In the home, family members can supply caring and love. Alongside his encomiums to home-based care, Regan saw the revitalization of volunteerism as central to his welfare reform agenda. If the new federalism called on federal government to devolve its responsibilities to the state and municipal levels, Regan envisaged volunteer labor performing a similar transformative role in the nonprofit sector. What federalism is to public sector, he asserted, volunteerism and private initiative are to the private sector. The country is bursting with ideas and creativity, but a government run by decree has no way to respond. Volunteerism is an essential part of our plan to give the government back to the people. As social service budgets were, were whittled back, neoliberals and neoconservatives loudly touted the virtues of community empowerment through self-care. In a report sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute in 1981, the public health theorists and former New Left activists Lowell S. Levin and Ellen L. Eidler identified self-care as an ideal alternative to the welfare state. For these perhaps unwitting messengers of the new right, the burdens of care engendered by the deinstitutionalization of public hospital patients called for a simultaneous reinstitutionalization of the private family, church, and charity as natural conduits for self-care. Their prescriptions in many ways anticipated the actual contours of policy change over the next few decades, where filial obligation laws, faith-based welfare reform, and the selective mobilization of the nonprofit sector would reinvent family, church, and charity as the prime mediating institutions of social policy. The effects of neoliberal health care reform were felt acutely in New York, the epicenter of the U.S. AIDS epidemic in the late 1980s. As noted by Charles Perrault in Morrow F. and Morrow F. Gillen, AIDS came to a city particularly ill prepared to cope with it. New York City had been declared officially bankrupt during the recession of 1975, when bankers refused to purchase its municipal bonds and roll over its debts. The city was subsequently subjected to a prolonged austerity regime conducted under the vigilant eyes of its business elites that sought to restructure the economy around financial services and real estate while purging the poor from the city center using a combined strategy of regressive tax concessions and cuts to social services. Well before the sea change of the Reagan revolution, New York served as a laboratory for neoliberal reform. The crisis regime that was imposed in the wake of its bankruptcy prefigured the impact of the Volcker shock at a national level and served as prelude to the wave of structural adjustment programs that would be rolled out across the world during the 1980s. Healthcare was a prime target of Mayor Ed Koch's budget cuts, according to one study. The city's hospitals closed up to 1,800 beds in the first half of the 1980s, at a time when AIDS infections were increasing at an alarming pace. Even by the end of the decade, state and city officials remained seemingly oblivious to the urgency of the situation. As late as 1989, President George H.W. Bush was proposing to cut funds to New York City hospitals, while the governor refused to spend funds that had been appropriated by the legislature. Fewer than a third of the 500 new AIDS beds that had been repeatedly promised became available before the end of the decade, and many of these remained unused because of a shortage of qualified um, nursing staff. As a result of this institutional inertia, grassroots AIDS service organizations were almost alone in mounting any kind of response during the first five years of the epidemic. In the cities hardest hit by HIV, New York, San Francisco, Washington, and Los Angeles, gay men, lesbians, transgender women, and their allies marshaled vast amounts of unpaid labor to confront the urgent health care, housing, and social service needs of the HIV infected while also initiating the first prevention campaigns. In New York, Gay Men's Health Crisis, GMHC, 
provided the only substantial services to people living with AIDS until 1985, when Regan finally broke his silence and small levels of federal and state support began to trickle through to nonprofits. Set up by a small group of activists with no outside support in early 1982 and operating out of a few rooms in a boarding house, the organization had, by the end of the year, amassed a volunteer force of over 300 individuals and was training up to 50 new volunteers a month. The early AIDS service organizations were well aware of the catch-22 in which they found themselves. The decision to set up health care and other services within the gay community was a political one. The early AIDS service organizations were the inheritors of the self-care movement of the 1970s <clears throat> and were reluctant to cede control to a public health sector perceived as punitive and imbued with normative ideas about sexuality. In the early 1980s, the patho pathologization of sexual deviance was far from a distant memory. Homosexuality was still illegal in many states, while Regan's key advisors on AIDS, the cultural conservatives William Bennett and Gary Bauer, were threatening to resurrect old public health methods such as quarantine, the closure of bathhouses, and compulsory testing. But in a context where Regan was touting the virtues of volunteerism as a solution to the failures of the social state, self-care also represented a practical capitulation to neoliberal social policy. In the early years of the epidemic, AIDS activists had no other choice than to take care of themselves, short of doing nothing, and so ended up assuming responsibilities that might otherwise have been taken on by the state. The political influence that, that the new left health care initiatives of the 1970s had been able to exert from the margins at a time of proliferating welfare services was severely diminished in a context where these initiatives were simply substituting for state welfare. The effect of the expanding welfare agenda of the Great Society in its aftermath was to push the frontier of care services provided by the state beyond the racial and sexual limits of the Fortis family wage. The counter effect of neoliberal budget cuts was to shrink this space, but also, as if accidentally, to reinscribe limits to care along the familiar lines of racial, gender, and sexual difference. Beyond the charmed circle of the privately insured family, Health care was not readily, readily available unless one took care of oneself. Personal responsibility was invoked nowhere more forcefully than at the margins.